It's nice. So anyway, um, so the film will be pre is uh, premiered in New York City on September 18th, and it premiered in Los Angeles on September 26th. Those were the main big premiere events, and then we'll be doing a uh, tour of local premieres, uh, including San Francisco at Opera Plaza Cinema tomorrow, uh, Monday night at 7. It's actually the only one that's not uh, sold out, so there are a few dozen seats left if you would like to grab a seat, depending on whether or not I make the movie sound interesting. So, uh, does anyone... You've all heard the term speciesism, have you? Raise your hand if you have heard it. It's like a good percentage. Okay, yeah. Well, the term speciesism was developed, it was coined by Richard Ryder in the early 1970s in a, in a flyer about animal experimentation. And then it was, of course, popularized by Peter Singer in 1975 in his book Animal Liberation. And so Singer and Ryder and these others argued that our, our sort of basic ethical principles that causing harm, causing suffering uh, to others that we hold among humans, that all ethical systems and moral theories hold, apply to, to non-human animals, to members of other species, precisely because they're capable of suffering physically and psychologically. And so they argue, Singer, Tom Reagan, Gary Francione, of course Richard Ryder and others, that our unthinking assumption against taking seriously the interests of non-human animals, of members of other species, is a form of prejudice. No more justifiable, they say, than prejudices against groups of humans, like racism and sexism. And the reason that that's significant, of course, is because I think what we're all familiar with uh, is the way animals are treated on factory farms, of course, battery cages, gestation crates, broiler sheds, animals being kept for their entire lives in spaces barely larger than their own bodies. Um, we all know it. A any one of you could probably explain it just as well as I could. Everything is controlled from the lighting to the uh, ventilation. And having been inside a factory farm, how many of you have been inside of factory farms? It's quite a, oh good. I guess good isn't the, good isn't the word, but, but um, it's, um, it, it's, it's very much like a science, I mean, it's like a science fiction movie, like a dysutopian science fiction movie, to see animals as if they were machines and everything controlled uh, to the T, as if they are, in fact, items in factories. But the reason that's significant is, of course, we all feel bad about the treatment of animals. And, and pretty much everyone does, and that's why everyone's against um, the mistreatment of animals as a general matter. But if it is true that we cannot justify a distinction between human interests and the interests of non-human animals in terms of their ethical significance, that would mean, if we can't justify speciesism, that the suffering that happens to these animals on factory farms is, as an ethical matter, as serious of a situation as if these were billions of humans, which would mean, since there are literally over a billion animals on factory farms in the United States right now, at any given moment, that would mean that what happens to animals on factory farms is the most significant um, ethical issue of our time, if not in the history of the world, which is a remarkable, remarkable conclusion. So what I wanted to know is, is there really something to the argument? Is it really true that we can't justify this ethical distinction between humans and non-human animals, therefore making factory farming perhaps the most significant issue uh, in the history of the world? Or is there something fundamentally flawed, something that does justify thinking that humans are more important? And I think there are two main lines of argument uh, and objections, at least that I put forward in learning about this while making the film, because I was not familiar with the topic in making the film, and I was indeed persuaded that there's really something to this as I made the film. Uh, so I started out very much as an outsider. And so the first line of argument, of course, is, you know, it's natural, right? And of course, we've all heard that, right? There's a natural order and so forth. And of course, the problem with that being that the definition of natural um, 
really doesn't exist. That if we want to define, let's say, for example, uh, natural as everything that there was a direct uh, evolutionary advantage to, rather than something that happened to ride on the coattails of some sort of characteristic that was evolutionarily beneficial, then uh, we could define that as natural. Or we could say it was behaviors that we engaged in before we uh, existed in industrialized societies. Or we could say that since we're animals, and uh, what else would we be part of uh, if not nature, then everything we do is natural. But any definition of natural that we want to create, whether it's everything that we do or things that we did before industrialized society or whatever it is, all of those things include behaviors that we're opposed to, like engaging in war, which we've done throughout history. And of course, that doesn't mean that we're not opposed to it and want to do what we can to prevent wars. So the fact that something is natural by any definition doesn't seem to have much value. Uh, and so then the other, the other line of argument that I always put forward is um, there must be something special about humans, right? There just, there must be something about us, this is at least what I thought when I was making the film, that would justify thinking that our interest, our suffering is more important. I mean, look, we, we do things like having festivals, we do things like having, um, you know, using language and making tools and... Uh, communication of all kinds, and uh, so that must somehow, and we're also moral agents, we think and talk about ethics like we are right now. So surely that must justify thinking that humans are, are special in some way. The problem being, of course, that there are many humans that lack any characteristic that we think is really special about humans. Babies and intellectually disabled people who don't even have the potential to be moral agents or to organize festivals or to give talks or anything like that. So if any of these characteristics that we always talk about being the relevant characteristic that makes humans more important, if any of these um, were really what we used to decide who matters in ethics, then a whole lot of people would be excluded, most obviously babies, but also um, people who are intellectually disabled, if you think that the potential of babies is relevant in some way. So anyway, so I, I looked into this, and, and the more I thought about it, the more... Is that a question? Yeah. Oh, sure, go ahead. Okay with, like, sure, why not? Uh, this is a book I was reading recently, that says, we have a neo... I'm not justified in having the animals, by the way. There is a group of the neocortex part of the brain, mm -hmm. which is unique to humans. So if there are, for example... Because there are a lot of things that are unique to humans. For example, we're the only primates that uh, don't have hair all over our bodies, probably because we evolved as, um, as uh, uh, aquatic apes. Uh, we're also, for example, uh, the only animals as a species as a whole that cook food. Mark Beckoff, the biologist, pointed that out. Uh, the, the thing is, though, if we consider this, this characteristic relevant ethically in terms of, for example, the co right, right, exactly, the cognitive abilities that the neocortex um, gives us or our ability to cook food or whatever, uh, there are many humans who are excluded from that characteristic, like, as we say, babies and intellectually disabled people. And that's really the crux of it. That's, that's the problem. But it seems to me like... That seems crazy because if it's really true that we can't justify, that we can't find any characteristic that all humans possess, that non-human animals don't um, possess, that can justify, that, that form the basis of an ethical principle in some way, it, it really would make what happens to animals on factory farms the most serious if, uh, ethical issue of our time. It just can't. It, it can't be the case. But the more I learned about it, the more I really, as much as I felt that there was something that um, I wanted to believe justified this distinction, I, 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 um, I couldn't find one. So I, I went off and I investigated factory farms. And have any of you ever seen pig farms or been to a pig farm? What kind of factory farm have you been inside? Chicken farms, yeah. Well, pig farms, it's a remarkable thing. In eastern North Carolina, I drove down there and uh, we all know that there's some sort of environmental problem going on there, but it has to be seen to be believed, and that's why I drove down there with the camera. There are literally um, 
thousands and thousands of pigs in a single building on slatted concrete floors. And their, all of their manure is flushed from basically in between these slats in the floors, not to be unnecessarily gross, into giant open air cesspools, which they call lagoons, but obviously far from lagoons, <laughs> euphemistic. Uh, that are literally the size of football fields, and they're up to like 30 feet deep, and it's just all pig manure. And the neighbors, of course, their water is getting um, uh, contaminated, and they, they can't use their wells. Uh, then, the, uh, in order to get rid of all of this pig manure, they actually, and I saw it with my own eyes, and I filmed it, and it, it's just, I wouldn't have believed it had I not seen it on uh, seen it myself, or then, of course, uh, been able to film it and show it to people. But the way they get rid of it, if you s sneak through the bushes, a as I did, that hide the farms, because they, they really make a lot of effort to try to hide it. So they put a lot of thorn bushes that we had to get through, but we did. And, um, and we also flew in airplanes overhead, as you'll see in the movie. Um, they sp well, I can anyone guess what they do? I guess I almost said it, didn't I? Okay. Mm -hmm. that, um, I know at cow farms that they do that. So right, and dairy farms just, especially. They go ahead and just spray it on the grass as and like a fertilizer. As if it's grass. fertilizer, yeah. ostensibly fertilizer, but way, way more than could actually be used right. to fertilize crops. But they don't just spray it. They spray it, get this, I, I, this is ridiculous, straight up into the air, like, like several dozen feet up into the air. And it turns into mist and ends up on people's houses. Like it literally goes, and it goes inside of their houses, it goes all over their cars. There are people who walk outside at, on the days when the wind is coming towards them and they collapse in their front yards because there are sprayers just a couple dozen feet away of pig manure in the air. And if you can imagine this is how they treat their neighbors, can you imagine what it's like to be a pig? And pigs, remember, are, are intelligent animals who have um, a lot, a lot of um, behavioral needs. They're, they're at least as intelligent as dogs by various standards that we use. So this is just one example of what I found. And again, you'll, you'll see it in the movie. I can describe it, but to see it in person is just ridiculous. And it's a good thing I'm here today, actually, because I, I, uh, they, uh, the last pig farm we went to, some people came out with shotguns, and we jumped into the car at the last minute and drove away. There were a couple of people uh, coming after us, but we, we, uh, it's in the outtakes. Um, uh, yes? How, how did you get access, generally? As a general matter, with the pig farms, we, we did indeed actually, because we were looking at the pollution there, we did two things. We literally went through the bushes uh, where they hide the, the, uh, what they call spray fields. They have all this little like underground pumping system with all these um, white little like sticks that are coming out of the ground every like dozen or so feet. And they're, hot, they're, they're shrouded in these like fast growing bushes. And then what they also do, we also had to go over these um, like trenches, they dig trenches, like to, to keep people out. I, I guess that worked better than fences. It's like um, maybe like 10 feet down, just they're called a V ditch. You know those? And they go down like this and then on the ground and then up the other side. So we had to climb down through this trench, then climb up and then go through these bushes. So, so we did that. And then we also, though, you know, you still can't quite see what the manure lagoons are like, the whole thing. So what we did is we, I, I commissioned an airplane to a propeller plane, and we got in the propeller plane, I used a long range zoom, and we flew around uh, over, the, uh, over the places to zoom in, and it really freaked out the factory farmers, because we were circling their, their little things there. Um, but, um, so that's that, and that's just one example. I mean, we traveled all over the country, we visited egg farms, we spoke to, and how many of you ever wanted to ask a factory farmer, like, wh what is going on in your head? Right, so I, I got a chance to do that. We just what, there were there are some egg farms that are that are owned. They're like eight hundred thousand bird egg farms. One uh, down near, not too far from Los Angeles, and um, we uh, we went we went up to them and we just found the owner and we walked up with the camera and we just started asking her questions and and we got her to to start talking about things and it was quite quite an interesting. Uh, thing to see, as again, you'll, you'll see in the film. 
Uh, but it really gives you an idea of what their mindset is like. And it's, um, it's not a mind that you want uh, having much influence in the world, believe me. Uh, another thing about factory farming I wanted to mention. Is the factory farming stuff that I'm describing interesting? OK, good. OK, good. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I want to add something else about factory farming. We went to a turkey farm. And we tricked the factory farmers into letting us in and giving us a tour. And the reason they wanted to give us a tour is because we wanted, we said, to make a movie about how much better their higher welfare, humane farm was than regular factory farms. And they actually sell to Whole Foods. And they're among, of course, the highest standards. I'm sorry, what were you about to say? No, no. Yeah, oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so yeah, they, they were shaking your head at the... But, um, but yeah, that's, and, and I was... Um, so yeah, so, so I went on there, we, and I really anticipated, of course. I said, well, look, of course it's still going to be bad. There are going to be things that are bad, but it's not going to be a factory farm. This was considered on, it's on the Whole Foods website. It's called Free Range. It's actually called, get this, the, the name is Cox Turkey Farm. And the owner is Mr. Cock. But anyway, um, so, so anyway, so we went on here. And, and they were really thrilled to show us around because I talked to him on the phone and buttered him up about how, you know, I really want to show how, how different this is from the regular factory farms. And he was very glad to show us around. So we put on this little, like, ridiculous-looking moon suit thing. Like, you had to wear, like, a, a little plastic thing on your head, you know, because of the um, biosecurity stuff. And uh, we went in. And guess how, ma how much room the birds have in this free-range farm? Somebody, somebody guess. I mean, it's not a factory. It's not a traditional factory farm. Somebody, somebody either shout it out or raise your hand. Okay, go ahead. Uh, in a, in a free-range farm for a turkey? Turkeys. They're, the turkeys are bigger than an iPad. But, but for broiler chickens on a regular broiler farm, yeah. Well, I'll just tell you, this is, again, free-range farm, three square feet per bird. Thousands of birds in a single shed. And this is something they were proud to show us. And then, get this, those, on the Whole Foods website, they showed them in the grass, like out in the grass. So I was trying to figure out, well, where did they even get this picture? Guess what? They, they have two different sheds. The first shed is for when they're babies. And then once they get a certain age, they walk across this field. <laughs> for like five minutes into the other shed, which is the finishing shed where they spend the rest of their lives. Yes? I'd like to add a little bit. Yeah. To that. Uh, Whole Foods, of course, holds itself up as this paragon of, of virtue as far as humane farming goes. Um, but I, I was part of an investigation of a place called Cal Cruz Hatchery. Mm -hmm. uh, atrocious treatment. Uh, Compassion over killing did an undercover investigation. And mm -hmm. then we were trying Sorry. to figure out where Cal Cruz Hatchery sells these atrociously treated birds. And a Safeway, and a Walmart. We found that's a very, a very important point. That the hatcheries, which are some of the worst things, we're talking about things that, you know, in the case of eggs. I mean, I know that so wasn't an egg broiler, one; right, those yeah. are broilers. But in eggs, you know, they grind up the, the uh, chicks alive. And these things are sold to all the free-range ones, even yeah. the, the so-called best ones. Reasons, yeah. Even the, yeah. The So it's, 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 yeah. and, and you'll see it in the, the film. And although, on the other hand, just so you know, the film, we went out of our way for the film not to be, uh, thank you for adding that. I appreciate it. I really appreciate that. That's a good, that's a very important point, the hatcheries. Uh, and anyway, so in the film, um, it's not, just as a note, purposely, because we don't need blood and gore in order to get the point. You'll see inside of the factory farms and you'll see how much room they have and so forth, but this is not like Earthlings 2. You're not going to, you don't have to worry about like, you know, throwing up after the movie or something like that, I promise. Uh, so you'll be able to enjoy the film. Uh, by the way, uh, for those of you who came in late, it's, it's tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow night at 7. Does anyone not have a little thing here? Because I, I, um, I like these. I like this little scale thing. Okay, excellent. Here, someone can uh, pass them back, perhaps, to whoever doesn't have one. Oh, and there, there's an extra one there. Yeah, if you don't, if you don't have one, please uh, go ahead and take one, because they're about to be sold out. There are only a few dozen seats left for tomorrow's screening. It's tomorrow at 7.
Yes, yes, thank you for reminding me. Type in SFVS, San Francisco Vegetarian Society, and you'll get, uh, I think, at least 25% off. I just want to say one last thing. These, are a f I did, these were just a few examples of some of the things that I found traveling around the country. Uh, it, was just, it was just endless. Let me see where we are time-wise. Yeah, it, it was, I'll just say a, a, maybe one last example, one last story that I just have to say because it was just so bizarre to see. Have, does anyone know um, FFA, Future Farmers of America? Okay, you know that, yeah. Yeah, so, so they're basically, it's people who are going to be farmers in the future. So they're children who are learning about agriculture, and I spoke with them, because I wanted to see, you know, we could talk to the factory farmers earlier in the film, and I walked up to them and all this, but what is it really like, what, what, what is the mindset like when they're younger? And um, there, it, was, um, it was quite astonishing to see, uh, to see how they, how they talk about uh, oh, well, you know, we, yeah, we, our family has 9,000 pigs in two buildings, but they're treated fine. I mean, if they, you know, they wouldn't, if, if they weren't, if they weren't uh, treated, if it wasn't good for the pigs, they wouldn't be doing it. Things like that. So it's, uh, it's remarkable to see how people transform from that into being in the factory farming industry. The last thing I want to say, though, I could just, there are so many examples, but you'll just have to see it in the film, and plus you can't describe it. You have to just, you have to see it. Uh, if you don't get a chance to see it this time, I'm sure, you know, the, but um, the last thing I just want to mention is something about effective advocacy that I learned. For those of you who are effective, like educating others, one of the most effective, powerful things that you can do is something as simple as leafleting. And if you, does anyone here ever do uh, vegetarian or vegan leafleting at all? Okay, yeah. It's, it changes lives more than almost anything else. If you go to um, a colleges and you use the leaflets of an organization like, for example, Vegan Outreach or Mercy for Animals, and you just pass them out with a smile, people's lives change. And the number of vegetarians and vegans is spiking, especially on college campuses, and it's not a coincidence. And uh, if you ever want to learn more about effective advocacy, there is a book by, everyone knows Matt Ball from Vegan Outreach and Bruce Friedrich from Farm Sanctuary. They co-wrote a book. And when you put these two geniuses together, my goodness, they co-wrote a book called The Animal Activist Handbook that I read. I think it's the only book I can, in recent memory, remember reading in one sitting. And it is so packed, full of information about how to educate others about the topic and do so effectively. It really changed how I think about um, educating people about the cause, and I highly recommend it. But other than that, uh, are there any questions about the film or... Perhaps, perhaps anything else. And, for, and remember, you know, I'm I'm sort of a reporter on this, so don't expect me to know all the answers. But I'll I'll uh, try. Agri Agribusiness is trying to suspend the First Amendment for uh, investigative reporters and journalists and activists right. in some state. And I wanted to see how you factor that into how you made your documentary and and how you went about trying to protect yourself legally. Uh, we, at the time that I was doing most of the filming for this, the, the only ag, there weren't actually any ag gag laws yet. The ag gag laws are the laws you. I'm sure you've all heard about this. People who film factory farms can be uh, put in jail for it. Literally, in in some states like Utah, for example, just for walking up uh, to a factory farm and like taking pictures with your phone from across the street, you can literally be arrested. That's extraordinary, and that's an amazing example of how much power agribusiness has. Um, I, right now, it's not, um, in, in the case of the film, we, we weren't um, affected by it, but in future projects that I'm doing that will involve a little bit more high-tech spying, I can't go out into too much detail now, uh, but though that will be a scenario, and I can only think, though, if I get arrested for filming a factory farm, that will probably be better publicity than anything else into factory farming. So I'll see you in jail. At, you know, <laughs> fine. Yeah. Now, now I, I assume that once these are court tested and they move through appellate courts, we'll see. And I assume it hopefully it'll get to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court will say the First Amendment protects journalists, investigative reporters, 
and no state has the right to suspend the First Amendment. We'll see. We'll see. There's very interesting. Uh, I'm unfortunately in law school. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, well, and, and so I actually did a paper on, on AIAG laws, and, and it's interesting because especially in Idaho, I mean, I'm sorry, not in Idaho, in uh, Iowa, they found very clever ways to sort of skirt the language of existing laws on that issue. So it's really, they, they've been clever, and it's not clear what's, it's really not clear what's going to happen if they're going to get struck down. There was another question somewhere, somewhere over here, yes. Yeah, actually, I'm sorry if you already said, but so what is the plan for the new Oh, yeah, right. So, so the world premiere was in New York City on September 18th, and the uh, West Coast premiere was in Los Angeles on the 26th, this last Thursday. Uh, and the third screening ever will be in San Francisco tomorrow night at Opera Plaza Cinema at 7. You have to buy the tickets online, so go to the website speciesismthemovie.com, and you'll be able to get them. And again, SFVS is the promo code, so you'll be able to get a discount. Uh, after that, it will be do screen, doing screenings in Chicago, D.C., and other cities. Uh, and after the theatrical run, it will be on uh, Netflix and iTunes and so forth. Uh, we also have the DVDs on pre-order. It's been really remarkable to see in the preview screenings how many people told me afterwards how much the film uh, affected them. I, I was really, really thrilled to see that. So I hope people will be able to use it as, a, as an educational tool, and I certainly hope you enjoy it when you get a chance to see it and, and hope uh, that you will indeed find it to be a useful tool. But yeah, that'll be, that'll be the plan right now. Are there any Have other questions? Any I'm sorry? Have you been to any film festivals? No, we're doing straight, straight theaters. Oh. Oh, on the recommendation of actually uh, Brian Wendell from Forks Over Knives. I talked to him and I said, what film festivals should I go? And he said, none. He said, yeah, I didn't know that. He said, uh, unless you really want the Laurel, little Laurel thing on your DVD for being in this and that festival, the fastest way to get to people is, if you have the money to do it, which we were lucky enough to have investors and so forth, to go straight to, I was going to say actual theaters. That's not the right word, but theaters. Um, and, and then, of course, the DVD, iTunes, Netflix, and so on. Yes? So this means you're not showing the film tonight? No, it'll be. Uh, I know. I was so. I was disappointed I that all these people thought that. I'm to show it. No, no. I'm. Uh, I'm going to talk. I'm yeah. It would be cool if I could show it on the mirror, but. <laughs> yeah. I, I was. I suspect people were wondering, like, are they going to show it on that? How is that? No. But 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 it will be tomorrow night if you get a chance to see it, and there will also be a Q and A after the film if you want to ask me additional questions once you've seen it, because I can only describe so much. You know. That, that's why I brought the camera around. Is there a a what? Uh, it's it's twelve dollars and it's twenty five percent off with SFVS as the promo code. Yeah, we make it as cheap as possible just to cover the operating expenses of the organization because I want as many people to see it as possible. Let's do yeah maybe one or two other questions and then and then we'll head out. Go, no, go ahead if you. Oh, no, I, I just want to know was it going to be also screened here in San Francisco after the premiere? Uh, it'll be screening in New York and Los Angeles probably after the premiere. Uh, we don't have like a uh, a big theater run for San Francisco scheduled, although people will be uh, screening it. Uh, where we'll be helping organizations do screenings, say like at Berkeley and so forth. Well, thank you again, very very much. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yes, they will be listed under screenings. Yes, we actually do. Yes, uh, and we will also. Although I'm, I can't guarantee that every single one of them will be listed but at least the major ones should be listed. Uh, and we will have, uh, if you join the mailing list on our website, there's a little place to put to submit your email address, and there you'll be able to um, see the, uh, you'll be able to get updated when we have a big, another roster of another uh, national tour of, of uh, screenings and stuff like that. So thank you again very much for uh, coming and hearing me uh, speak. I've described the things I've seen as, as well, um, as I could, but hopefully when you get a chance to see it in the film, uh, and uh, you'll, uh, you'll have a, even more of an experience and be able to uh, ask me certainly whatever you'd like if you're able to come tomorrow night. Thank you again very, very much. Appreciate it. Your goal with the with the movie, if you have like, like a specific one, like a 